Hi, my name is Leah Day, and welcome to this video for the Building Blocks Quilt Along. We are piecing block number 10. We're almost at the end, just two more blocks to go. So today is block 10, and we are making a basket block. And I have to say, I love basket blocks. They have always kind of, I don't know why, they, they're just like that kind of whimsical thing. They just really make me happy. So the very first thing we're going to get started with are our half square triangles. And to make all four blocks, you're going to need 12 half square triangles. There's three per block. And basically the steps are exactly the same as the pinwheel block we learned for number six. Block number six, if you need a really good review, go check out that block. But basically all I've done here is marked a diagonal line from corner to corner. I've got an A square and a B square layered on top of one another. I've stitched to either side of that diagonal line a quarter of an inch away. And now I'm simply going to cut the two half square triangles apart, just simply slicing right down the middle on that first marked diagonal line. So for every for every half square unit, you're going to get two half square triangles. Just simply take that, very gently finger press this open and hit it with your iron. Do that for both of them. And really, it, it's going to save you some time to go on ahead and prepare all of your half square triangles first. It's going to make this all four blocks go together a lot faster. So to prepare them past this point, what you're going to want to do, press this open then trim this square down. We always piece our half square triangles bigger than they need to be and then we trim them down and these need to be three and a half inches. So go on ahead and do all of those steps and I'll meet you back here whenever you're ready for the next step. Alright, so to put our block together you're going to just simply arrange your pieces and you gotta have to be careful with it. You see how I'm doing this wrong? Flip them around so you've got your nice triangle shape created by your basket. It's going to look like this. And so basically it's three half square triangles and one plain B square that are going to come together to make the center of the block. So what I'm going to do is just simply layer one triangle on top of the other. And this might be a little tricky because you see we have kind of a bulky seam allowance on this side and a bulky seam allowance on this side. So let's go to the machine and I'll give you some tips on stitching through this really accurately. So I'm aligning these pieces together and because we've got kind of the half square triangle, um, little seam allowance on this area and on the other end, we have kind of both ends are a little bulky. You might want to place just a pen at the beginning and a pen at the end just to make sure you don't get any shifting if you like that idea, place some pens. If you don't like that idea, of course, don't place any pens. It's entirely up to you. Another thing's going to help, we learned this last month, go ahead and stitch off the edge of your scrap charger with your needle in the down position. Lift your presser foot. You can do this with your hand or I'm using a knee lifter. Lift your presser foot and slide the pieces on in so that your foot is up on top of those seam allowances and so that the next stitch you take is going to be onto the fabric and that's going to make it so nothing's shifting kind of downward on you and yes I did just stitch over my pen don't yell at me about it <laughs> I always forget that if you stitch slowly enough you can usually get away with it but the pol quilting police might come after me they like to yell at me about that one <laughs> there we go as you near the end just kind of stitch slowly as you stitch off the edge and nothing should shift. And then of course stitch right back onto another strap charger so that way your foot stays at the nice height and you don't have long thread tails to deal with. Okay, so this is what it should look like. If you really want to get obsessive about it and you want to know if everything's going to work out perfectly, take your ruler, a rotary ruler, and lay it on this little part right here. And from the tip of that triangle to the edge of your block, you should have a quarter of an inch and the same thing up here. So if you want to go double check yourself, that's a good way to do it. Just finger press this open and we'll be ready for the next step. Okay, so I've finger pressed this open and given it a good little press with my iron. So it's ready to go. You're basically going to repeat the exact same steps for these two top pieces. Simply align one on top of the other. 
I like to always start with the bulky, the bulkiest part, any seam allowance, so I kind of flip it and stitch it running down that way. That's perfectly fine. Stitch the seam, press it open, and this is what you'll get. So that is the two kind of piece units coming together. Now I just simply flip one on top of the other, and we want to make sure to match this center seam. And let me get to the machine and give you some tips on matching up so that this fits and hits dead on. So this is kind of the trickiest seam to match in this whole block. You want to kind of just pinch with your thumb and your finger, double checking that you've got a good alignment with those seams, also flipping back and making sure that the edges are in proper alignment. If you want to trim some bulk, you can. We've got a little bit of bulk, you know, kind of behind these seam allowances with the half square triangles. It's entirely up to you. Sometimes uh, trimming is a great thing and it will reduce bulk. Sometimes trimming is a bad thing and, uh, you know, you clip something and then all of a sudden you can't seem to match the seams because you don't have that stability. Sometimes more fabric creates more stability. So it's entirely up to you if you want to trim that down and reduce bulk or not, we're going to be able to quilt it just fine, so it's fine either way. Okay, so that's nice and secure and stable. It's time to stitch it. And you know, another thing about trimming the seam allowance a little bit, you can always trim after you've stitched the seam and just kind of very carefully tuck your scissors down in there and get in those nooks and crannies and just kind of take out some of the bulk. That's what's nice. The biggest thing to keep in mind is that, you know, oops, I did hit that pin dead on. Sorry, quilting please. Um, the biggest thing to keep in mind is that, you know, these seam allowances don't disappear underneath our block. They are always going to still be there. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're going to be quilting over this block. Remember that and um, be careful in those areas. Just be really, um, you know, stitch in those areas very slowly and it's going to work out fine. Okay, so there we go. We've got our three half square triangles fit together with our extra square. Our, our basket is coming together. I'm going to very gently finger press this open and this is the time when I like to kind of trim things up a little bit. I don't usually trim before I piece the seam simply because um, I worry that I will trim something and I won't be able to match the pieces up very accurately. So instead I prefer to trim right now. I've already pieced it, it's already gathered, it's already matching well, and I can reduce that bulk considerably just by getting my scissors in here and just doing some little snips and reducing some of that seam allowance. It would be really nice if we flipped our block over and quilted from the side and all the seam allowance disappeared, but it doesn't happen that way. Uh, we like to think it does, but it doesn't. Those, those layers are still there and they're difficult to quilt over in free motion, so we have to always be mindful of that. I'm going to just finger press this open. You might have wanted to see me actually hit something with my iron, so I'm going to grab my iron real quick and show you how I actually press. I'm really, really firmly finger pressing that seam open because it's wanting to kind of lip up on me making sure everything is open before I grab my iron and I'm just gently pressing. I have a bad habit of dragging my iron across things and of course if you lip up any of your other seam allowances make sure to press that back down again. I also flip it over and give it a good press too. Of course, if you have light colored blocks, if you have light colored fabrics, a pressing cloth is always, always, always a good idea. You can really get in trouble uh, with lighter fabrics and a, and a super hot iron. Um, I have scorched more than enough white fabric to know that it can happen. So use a pressing cloth when you're pressing the surface of your block, unless you're using really dark fabrics like me, and then it doesn't matter. Okay, so that is ready to go. We're ready to go to the next step. Okay, so the next step is to arrange your center basket, your triangles, uh, with borders. And this is going to expand the block 
give us some space to hang on to when we're free motion quilting it. Uh, it's also going to give us a little bit of nice outer space around the block, about an inch of outer space all around the block that's going to really set it off. So all you do is simply stitch your these shorter strips to the top and bottom, stitch that seam, seam line with quarter inch seams, press the seams open to the top and bottom, and then simply attach the two sides. Again, stitch the seams, press the seams open, and you're ready to go. So now let's tackle that basket handle. To get started on your basket handle, you're going to need your uh, basket handle template. This is on page 68. You want to make sure when you print it that this square is exactly one inch so your handle is the right size. So what you want to do is take a piece of freezer paper. This is just butcher paper. You can get it in your grocery store. Place it paper side up on top of that template and trace it with a pencil or pen. It doesn't matter. Okay, you want to get a nice accurate tracing of that. Place this freezer paper on an, uh, an ironing sur surface. This is a pressing board and I'm just going to press it down. You've got a waxy side to freezer paper and a paper side. The waxy side is really cool. You can heat it up and it will stick to surfaces. It'll stick to fabric, it'll stick to the surface of the ironing board, it'll also stick to itself. So to make this kind of nice and a stiff so that way we can work on it we can use it as a template I'm gonna lay just another piece of freezer paper right on top and press it too and I'm pressing with a hot dry iron no steam now give it a second because it's gonna be pretty toasty you don't want to touch it right this second you can just kind of maybe use a pair of scissors to get it up off of your yeah, it's, it's cooled down already, so it's fine. But just watch out for that. It will heat up, so don't burn yourself. Okay, so at this point, you can vaguely see those lines through the freezer paper. What you want to do is cut out the template on those lines. I'm just going to quickly cut this out. And you want to cut very cleanly. I wouldn't do this with a rotary cutter. Uh, it's not necessary. It's kind of hard, actually, to do this with a rotary cutter and have it really come out clean scissors are kind of the best thing and the reason you want it to come out clean you don't want a lot of jags in the um, template because that will come through in the fabric the way we're going to turn the edges of the fabric that will come through it will be visible so just be really gentle and take your time as you cut this out all right i've got my freezer paper template my little handle template cut out it's ready to go and i've got my handle fabric cut out and ready to go. So I'm just going to place my template and this is waxy side down, the shiny side down and hit it with your iron and that's going to really gently bond it in place. It's just going to be kind of stuck to the fabric which is a good thing. Okay so now I'm going to generally cut this out and I want to leave about a one inch seam allowance on all sides. You really don't want to cut this close. If you cut it close, you're not going to be able to turn it easily. It's going to make things a lot more difficult for yourself. So leave yourself one inch all the way around. And it's very generous. This is going to make it so much easier to turn these edges. I know I, when I first got started with applique, I cut things so narrow. I, I was basically cutting a quarter inch seam allowance all around. It was so hard to turn those edges. It was like pulling teeth. So I learned my lesson, cut big, and then turning is so much easier. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna start on this outside edge. Actually, we're gonna start on these little flaps because they're really kind of a good place to start. Get a little cup, a little lid, and your spray starch. I'm going to just spray a little bit into the cup. I'm going to grab a paintbrush and I'm going to paint a little starch right on that edge, just like that. I'm going to zoom in so you can see this really closely. 
So you can see that starch painted on right there. And you don't need a whole ton of it, and you don't need to get it on the paper. You don't want things to just really get too wet. So now I'm going to fold the fabric over along the edge of that template and hit it with my iron and just hold it there for a minute. What that's going to do is that is going to dry the starch. So it's already lighted, you know, lit up again back to the regular color of the fabric. It doesn't have that wet starch. It's very nice and stiff. And you can see what a nice crease that is making in the fabric. So keep it in there and do the same thing for the other side. Paint on the starch. And the reason I don't just take the spray bottle and spray all over it is you really want to control this. You really want it only in the areas you want it, right along the edge, not all over the freezer paper. Everything's just going to get way too wet and out of control. Okay, that looks good. Now I do need to trim these down at this point because we're going to be turning, of course, and making kind of corners on either side of this. So I'm going to go on ahead and trim this down. That's a roughly about a quarter of an inch where I'm trimming it. But having that nice big one inch seam allowance was what allowed us to turn that so easily. Okay, so now I find that working on the outside edge, the outside edge is kind of the, the easiest thing to do next. So I'm going to start from basically from this corner and I'm going to start working from left to right. I'm left handed though, so if you want to work in the opposite direction, that's just fine. Paint on some starch, starting in this corner, and I'm going to work about an inch at a time. Not anymore, otherwise it just gets too out of control. Just paint. And we're gently using the iron. I kind of like take the iron and slide it and then press. And that's kind of pushing the fabric against the template and holding it there securely. That looks good. Slide it over. Paint some more on. And do the same thing. Just pulling it up. And you're going to get... You know, of course, the fabric's going to have to fold. It's going to have to crease itself. You're going to see these little creases in here. That's that's perfectly fine. That's what you want. We are going to trim this seam allowance just like we did with these edges. We are going to trim this up a bit. So don't worry. This is not going to go on the finished quilt just like this. It's not going to be all wrinkly. It's not going to be a mess. But it does take a little bit of time. So just be patient as you work around the ring, around the handle. And you know, as an alternative, if you are looking at this going, I have no desire to learn how to do that. I, I don't want to bother. You know, if you are a, <clears throat> a fan of fusing, you can always cut this out, cut out the, you know, use the template and fuse it. That's perfectly fine too. You know, use the template as a guide to cut uh, a piece of fusible web, attach it to some fabric. And, and then cut out your basket handle that way, and then you'll have, you know, basically the exact same piece only fused, and you'll have raw edges, and that's perfectly fine too. When I get tied down at the end, I usually start working a little longer, a lot bigger pieces. And one thing that might help too, I'm kind of having some, some of this curve isn't coming out right, because probably because I'm talking so much. <laughs> um, one thing that might help is just kind of hold it in place with your fingers, but just don't hit your fingers with the iron. But that can sometimes help make that curve really nice and crisp too. And if you get something like right here, I'm kind of getting a funny, a funny spot right there. What you can do is just go back in, paint more starch on it, and maybe sometimes it helps if you just kind of flip the direction of the of the kind of tuck or fold that's happening. Sometimes that's all it takes is just make the fabric behave. Refold it, flip it, do whatever you have to do. Sometimes you just have to tell it who's boss. And I'm just painting on this very last tip. Flip 
flipping it over and giving it a press. There we go. So you can already see this beautiful curve that we're getting from this turned edge. And so at this point, I'm gonna go in and trim. Now, you might be wondering about this end. This is kind of winging out in this direction and that's not gonna look good in our quilt if we leave it that way. So what you can do, go back to the ends, you kind of readdress this at the end after you've turned everything, paint on some more starch, and this time pull it Pull the fabric around and, and force in pleats, whatever you gotta do, in order to get that end square like this. You see how that's just folded straight over square? Got a nice, nice curve there. Nice curve, nice corner. And it's just a matter of telling the fabric exactly where you want it to go. And that looks better. I can trim that up, you know, this extra seam allowance up back here, and it's it's gonna be perfect. Same thing for this other side. That was a little bit better, but I still need to kind of get it in control. I'm just simply pulling that over like that. And I'm forcing the, the pleat kind of back here. That's fine. That's what you want. And just hit it with the tip of your iron. And as far as irons go, I am just using the cheapest iron that Walmart sells. I do not believe in buying expensive irons. I did that once, and once was all it needed to tell me was, you know, that wasn't worth it. Um, I get like, spent like 10 bucks on my irons, and they last for years and years and years. And then when I notice they're either getting way too hot or not heating up fast enough for me, I go get another one. I've run through only about two irons since I was 21, so they do last a very long time. Okay, you want to trim this kind of clean. You see how I kind of, I was a little jagged with that. You want to trim it rather clean. Make sure you've got a nice curve to it. Nothing too jagged and crazy. So take your time that. Um, the reason we did the outer edge, I always find that it's a little bit more stable at this point. Uh, just things feel a little bit more under control. And so now I can do the inner edge. And so basically, in order to do this inner edge, we've got you know the outer circle kind of folding in, that's easy. We don't need to clip because we're creating kind of pleats in order to get it to, to curve, turn that edge. For the inner edge, we do have to clip because you can't turn that under without doing this. <laughs> so we're gonna have to clip. So I come in here, and about every half of an inch away, we're gonna clip not, we're not gonna hit the freezer paper, but we're coming very close. I would say about an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch away from the freezer paper. It's not the end of the world if you get too close. It's not the end of the world if you're too far away. It is gonna affect your turn and your fabric will make it pretty clear to you. So just keep that in mind. If you feel like, you know, you're turning something and the fabric's wanting to wing up on you, usually that just means that you need to go clip and get it under control again. Okay, so here we go. I do like to work, let's work from the center here. I kind of do this every single time I do it, I do it ever so slightly differently. So I'm gonna work from the center this time and see how that works, see how that goes. I know those edges are gonna be a little bit to fiddle with, so. This looks good. And what I'm doing is I'm just kind of gently pulling with my fingers and then coming in with the tip of the iron. I'm being very careful not to burn myself. I hate getting burned, so be mindful of that. If you want to use one of those little tiny craft irons, those little stick irons, that works good too. You have, might have a little bit more control. This is a small piece. It is rather fiddly. But you see how I kind of pull my fingers back as I come in with my iron, so I'm never that close to it. There we go. That looks good. All right, and I wanted to fiddle with this tip just a bit. This little end. These are kind of like your trickiest spots in the block. You just want to make sure that that just folds right over 
and then of course that's going to affect the, pe the little piece right above it. So just make sure it's all kind of folded and pressed in a place and it's going to look perfect. Yay, that came out great. It's kind of hard, you know, <laughs> yeah, I will admit, doing this on video, I'm always kind of holding my breath and hoping that it's not going to be a complete catastrophe um, because it does require a lot of concentration and trying to talk through it at the same time. It's, it's a bit challenging. So I'm very glad that this is coming out as well as it is. Um, I, I will admit there are times that I am making an applique like this and it's small and it's, you know, it's very precise. I want it to look really good. If it starts getting messy, if I get the freezer paper too wet, you know, if something just starts going out of control, I'll throw the whole thing away and start from scratch. So just keep that in mind. If you start, you know, going through this and it's not coming together as easy as mine is, just remember, it's just paper and fabric. You can go cut another piece. It's not the end of the world. I do that a lot, actually. So this looks great. If you want to, go on ahead and give it one more press. One more press to just set everything. Again, if you're using light fabrics, you might want to use a pressing cloth. I don't have to worry about it so much because this is very dark blue, but uh, white, especially with these high temperatures might, and, and starch combined, all might scorch a little. So just be careful of that. Okay, uh, obviously we want to trim some of this. We don't want to leave uh, this funky seam allowance on this block. So I'm going to just come in here with a pair of scissors and neatly trim running up that curve. Perfect. Okay, you've got a lot of little bits all over the place. So that looks really good. And really, the ease of this comes to, from two things. Doubling the freezer paper is really good. It creates a stiff template and using the starch to paint it on um, so that way you have something to turn against and then to have that nice stiff hold all of those things are important and I get a lot of questions about starch and bugs you know starch is a food based product so bugs are going to be attracted to it the only thing I ever have to say about that is well do you ever wash your quilt starch comes out it's not going to stay in the quilt after you wash it so don't worry about bugs being more or less attracted to your quilt because of it um, I've used it for years and I've never had a problem with that okay so now we have to very carefully remove the freezer paper. You cannot leave it in. We've got to pull it out. I know this might make you kind of scared. I mean, we bothered to put all those beautiful curves in. We don't want to ruin them. So be very gentle at this point. Set it down. Kind of you know, reestablish it into the shape and hit it with your iron very gently and everything will stay in shape. Okay, so we've got our basket block, the pieced section ready to go, and we've got our handle ready to go too. And the nice thing is, your template, you can reuse this for all four handles, so don't throw this away. You know, you can just use that same one over and over again. So now we need to, to place the handle on the block. And really, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can kind of just fiddle with it and eyeball it. That's going to be fine. Uh, just understand that that might not match completely with your quilting guides. Whenever you go to use the quilting guides to mark the block and, you know, uh, get the designs on the surface. But you also have this um, handle placement template. This is on page 67. Print it out full size. Make sure it's the, you know, this should measure 8 inches right here. Um, this section the triangle section should be six inches. And so place it uh, using a light box or a bright window, and then you're gonna be able to see where that handle is, at least some general lines, so that way you know exactly where to place it and it's exactly in the right position. So how do you secure this and make sure it's not gonna move? Well, in the pattern, I said you can glue it down. Um, Elmer's glue or Roxanne's glue based it. Those are two very good things that can go in and secure this kind of an applique and hold it in place firmly. Um, if you don't like the idea of Elmer's glue, Roxanne's glue based it is a very good product. These things do come out. They're starched based glues. They will come out of the quilt. It's not anything to worry about. It's not permanent. 
I uh, just simply because uh, this is a video and it's easier for me to show you, I'm going to pin this in place. So just so you, you can see that you don't have to use glue, you can just pin this in place. And I usually start, I want to make sure these two ends are in alignment. And then I usually start kind of up here at the top of the handle and then pin my way down. And I always like to have a little pin right here. So keeping that really a nice alignment. If there's any kind of gap between the handle and the basket right here, that will be pretty noticeable. Of course, you know, if you like that kind of placement, you could place the handle up higher. That's just not what the way I designed it. There's all kinds of fun things that you can do with this basket block. There's, it's really limitless. So if you want to change it up and make it your own, please feel free to. That's perfectly fine. But this is the way I kind of plan for it to look, and that looks good. So at this point, it's secure, it's stable. I feel confident that I can stitch through this and nothing's going to shift. So if you don't like the idea of glue, then understand you can just use five pins and hold it in place too. Just pin very carefully and make sure that you're not contorting the uh, handle as you place it. Okay, so how do we actually secure this handle in place? Well, there's always multiple methods with everything with quilting. The method I'm going to show you today is zigzag stitching. We're going to take this to the machine and with a very narrow zigzag we're going to stitch all around the handle and that's going to hold it in place. Now an alternative, if you don't like the look of zigzag on the surface, then you can always take a, a needle and thread and hand applique along the edge. And I have videos on hand applique. I'll link them up below this video so that way you can find them and you can see that alternative method. We're going to zigzag, so let's take it to the machine and get started. One thing you're going to want to do before you actually start stitching on your block is to use a little scrap charger and just play with your zigzag. Um, figure out how wide you want it to look and figure out how long you want the stitch length. In this situation, you're working with stitch length and width in order to get the stitch that you like. And you see how I started out with the factory settings and they were quite big and I narrowed it up um, and then I realized it was too narrow and I widened it out just a little bit and I found the stitch that I like. The machine is set up, it's ready to stitch and there's no guesswork. I don't wanna do this kind of thing on the block. That stitches that you would probably end up having to rip out. So do it on a scrap and save yourself some time. So here we go. I'm going to start in this lower corner. Actually, I'm going to start kind of going in this direction. It's one of those things you kind of have to fiddle with and figure out where you want to go, where it's going to feel the, the right place to start. I'm hanging on to this top thread and I'm going to drop the needle in the down position and I'm going to give that top thread a tug and bring that bobbin thread up to the surface and that is going to kind of keep that thread under control. I know exactly where it's at now. I also know where that needle is dropping, so if I need to adjust anything, I can. It's a good idea to know the swing of your needle. Um, know if it's going to swing off the edge of your applique or not. If it's not, you kind of want to go ahead and, and make that adjustment um, so that way you're sure you're catching the right edge. So here we go. I'm going to stitch and making sure that is stitching off the edge of the applique onto the block and then it's stitching onto the applique onto the handle just a little bit it's just taking out little bites okay I'm right here at that corner so I'm going to pivot and then at this point you kind of want to again maybe even use your hand wheel double check yourself you see how that's going to swing out I'm going to kind of shift everything around and get it right where I want it to, to land always understand that you can, you're the one in control, so long as you're controlling your speed and you're not just zooming through it, you can control where that needle is going to land and how much, how much of a bite it's going to take out on that edge, on that handle edge. So we're just working down, stitching very slowly. As you get close to a needle, just pull it back a little bit. You don't have to take it out, just pull it back a little bit so it's out of your way. I like securing the inner edge first simply because it's kind of um, everything from the inner edge will kind of slide outward so if we have an issue any issue with um, 
the fabric kind of wanting to do something funny, uh, moving, shifting, that kind of thing. Well, at least it's going to shift outward, which will fit with the fabric better than kind of we might get a pleat if we did it the opposite way. So it's one of those things that I've noticed having stitched as many of these blocks as I have. And it's a preference thing. If you like it the other way, hey, stitch it the other way. It's one of those things. I'm just trying to share what I noticed and, and, and what kind of became obvious to me having made a couple of these. I think stitching it from the inside and then securing the outside is a little easier. I'm going to back it up so you can see what my hands are doing as I secure this block. So you might want to see how my hands are kind of very gently putting pressure with this hand as it rotates and pivoting. You might have to, you know, I was kind of getting a little bit of fabric movement right there, so I just kind of reposition, slide that needle out, and then I can stitch on and finish up that edge. If you feel a needle kind of wiggling around under the foot, just go on ahead and remove it. Sometimes they can get in your way. There we go. Just stitch off that edge. Again, as we turn these corners, it's a good idea to use go to your hand wheel and maybe shift the block just a little bit until it's in the right position and then start stitching again. And you know, a zigzag stitch is not the only stitch you can do with this. If you wanted to do uh, a blanket stitch or a decorative stitch on your machine, that would be fine too. I was trying to minimize the appearance of the stitch on the surface of the quilt block. I was trying to minimize how kind of bulky or how showy it was. But if you like the look of it and you really want it to show off, you know, use some bright thread and use a decorative stitch and that would be really fun. So you can see I've kind of sped up a little bit. The more you do this, the more confident you get. And after having stitched that inner edge, you might be feeling like you can go a little faster with the outer edge. And this is kind of what I mean by ha doing the inner edge first, is any time that I feel like the fabric's kind of shifting, I can just kind of slide it outward with my fingertip and it's going to work just fine. just going to move in the direction that fabric wants to move. Okay, at this point you might be wondering what we're going to do with these thread tails and since they are going to be something we're going to stitch over or near very soon, I'm going to go on ahead and tie them in a knot. So they weren't really locked together in any way. I'm going to go on and tie them in a knot about an eighth of an inch away from the surface of the quilt block. I'm going to use a cheater needle. This is exactly like what I do for hiding threads and quilting. I'm going to take that cheater needle and pop these threads in and I'm not going to I'm not hiding them, I'm just kind of taking them to the back. There we go. That's taking them to the back, and they're going to be nice and secure. I'm going to stitch over them as I zigzag down. And that's a great way to secure those starting threads. You don't want the zigzag stitching to come out. And one more. There we go. And the same thing, I'll probably do the same thing for these threads, pull them to the back, just give them a little tug, and you'll be able to pull both threads to the back of the block and tie them off the same way. So that's nice and secure, and our zigzag is beautifully holding that handle in place. So that's it for our basket block. I really hope that you've enjoyed learning how to turn the edges of this applique and secure it down and also, you know, combine this with piecing. I think the combination of applique and piecing is just beautiful and that's really was the inspiration for designing this block and kind of putting that little touch of curves into this very, you know, rigid triangle, you know, triangle and blocky block. So that's kind of fun. And with, for me at least, in my kind of piecing history, um, I learned how to piece first. 
And when I learned applique, it kind of it opened up a whole new world for me. All of a sudden, I could use curves, and all of a sudden, I could design anything that I wanted just from my head, and put it on fabric. And and it was an ability to soften everything. With piecing, we're kind of limited to squares and triangles and rectangles, and everything's kind of box, boxy and blocky. Applique opens up those curves and that smoothness and that might be something that you really want to play with. Of course, there is a million ways to do applique. So understand this isn't the only way to do it. There's a lot simpler methods with fusibles, um, you know, just basically gluing the fabric on the surface. Uh, you don't have to turn the edge if you don't want to. There's raw edge applique. And also you don't have to zigzag on top of it. You can do hand applique where the stitches are kind of tucked underneath the piece so you don't even see the stitches on the surface of the block. So understand that this is just one technique. And if you didn't like one thing about it, try and figure out what that one thing was that you didn't like and go find an alternative way of doing it. Because this is a vast world. I've said that a lot this year. It's huge. And there's always, always, always more than one way of doing things. There's no right. There's no wrong. There's just the method that you like the best. So find it. I really hope that you'll go find and play with what you like to do. So this month you will need to piece this four times to make four blocks and these are going to go in the four corners of our quilt. I just think that that looks so pretty. It makes me smile every time I see this quilt because I love the baskets in the corners. It's, just, it's a silly thing but I, I love it. So uh, make four of them. We're going to learn how to quilt this four different times and we're going to have a lot of fun with many different free motion quilting designs. So I hope that you'll join me for that. My name is Leah Day and this has been a video for the Building Blocks Quilt Along. Pick up your your copy of the Building Blocks Quilt Pattern, which comes with all of the guides and templates that you saw in this video, as well as all of the piecing information that you need in order to make the block. You can find that pattern at leahday.com and join us as we learn how to piece and free motion quilt together. Until next time, let's go quilt.